it's now just a pleasure for me to uh, welcome Baylor uh, Fox Kemper, who's a professor in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences at Brown. Uh, Baylor uh, did his PhD uh, in Woods Hole um, in 2003 with Joe Pedlowski and Paolo Rizzoli. Um, uh, moved to uh, MIT and then Colorado Boulder. Uh, moved to Brown in 2013 where he's been ever since and he's uh, worked his way up the ranks and is now a professor there as I said. Um, he, we had the pleasure of having Baylor for a period in Cambridge in 2016 as a visitor on the, uh, a visiting scholar. Um, and uh, he's very well known for his work on uh, ocean fronts, eddies, floating marine debris, Langmuir turbulence, lots of soap processes that go on in the upper parts of the ocean. Um, and he's also a lead, order on, a lead author on the IPC chapter nine, Oceans, Cryosphere and Sea Level Change chapter for the next uh, review. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Baylor uh, to give this talk. He's going to talk about affronting ocean models, sub mesoscale interactions between fronts, instabilities, and waves. This is the first uh, image that I'd like to discuss. And I th think the key here is this has all of the phenomenon in one easily appreciable visual image that I'm going to be discussing. So this is Volcano National Park, which is in Hawaii, and this is hot lava that is <laughs> falling into the ocean, and you can see the steam that's rising. So you can imagine that there are enormous temperature and salinity gradients um, that, along this corrugated coastline, and you can see that by this foam layer that there's some kind of circulation here that's relatively large. There's a small boat for scale. Um, and then you can also see that there are surface waves. And so what we normally are not able to see in a visual image is, are the temperature and salinity gradients that make up ocean fronts throughout the world. And potentially, here's a little nice crenulation in one of those fronts. Maybe that's an instability of the uh, kinds of flow that would flow along shore here. Um, the kinds of fronts and eddies and the instabilities of the fronts and the surface waves and their interaction is the topic of the talk today. And what the, uh, I guess what I'd like you to take away from this picture is we're gonna be talking about these things on a much wider range of scales, but um, these are the essential pieces to keep in mind. Um, and I should say this is a work with a, a large number of collaborators listed here. Um, and thank you very much to, the, to both the webinar series, but also my many generous sponsors who funded this work over the years. So sub mesoscale fronts, to uh, poorly paraphrase Pope John Paul uh, II, <laughs> out of all the unimportant things about the climate, this is the most important. Uh, and by that, what I mean is the most important, uh, it's an extremely dynamically interesting piece of the overall climate system. When we worry about climate change and things like that, this probably is not the first thing that comes to mind, um, but we will get to some of those linkages in a very distant way, but not to make this overall talk uh, overly uh, uh, depressing. I'm going to stick more to the dynamics and more to the phenomena side rather than the uh, climate change side. Um, and we'll see how those pieces fit together. So we're gonna start with a tour of the scales. Um, and the key way to think about this is that the oceans are extremely vast and they're also diverse in terms of the diversity of phenomena for, uh, across those scales. Um, why fronts and really where are fronts coming from will be the second topic. We'll talk a little bit about waves in the climate system um, and then that will detour us into talking about what a parameterization is and I'm giving a few examples from uh, my group but with collaborators. And then we're going to put all these pieces together and talk about how waves affect fronts and the instabilities of fronts. And then the last piece is what some of the consequences of fronts are for problems that we have in mind. Um, things like plastics, oil, and energy cycle from the large to the small scale. 
So I hope everyone can see a movie right now. Um, this is a, an early uh, mesoscale eddy permitting simulation of a global climate model, the GFDL CM 2.4. This is a relatively, uh, this is a fine resolution climate model and then it has these eddies at all, but it also is a relatively coarse one compared to modern standards. And I'll jump to a finer resolution in a minute, but this has all of the ingredients of the climate system, atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, included and there are a few things to notice about this down here on you'll see that the clock is ticking by in months so these large eddies have a time scale that's naturally measured in months they are extremely slow compared to the rotation of the earth so the Rossby number is small um, the variable we're looking at here is sea surface temperature and so these are these gradients in sea surface temperature, and especially the particularly sharp ones, like here along the North Brazil current and its rings, are, um, are here along the Gulf Stream and its rings, are the fronts that we're going to be talking about. Since it is a relatively slow phenomenon in comparison to the rotation rate of the planet, we're going to be thinking about geostrophic balances or near geostrophic balances. Or really, in the frontal case, what's important is the thermal wind balance. So the fact that the uh, temperature gradient across the frontal flow um, is providing a pressure gradient or a, an anomaly in pressure gradient from the surface to depth that results in a sheared geostrophic current in the front. Um, here's you know, the biggest front of all. We have an El Nino that's now transitioning into a La Nina. Beautiful, interesting, complicated, turbulent flow. Here we are, the uh, MIT GCM LLC 4320 um, model is what's being shown now. And you can see this is now not temperatures, but velocities. And so you can see those same fronts all around the world, the pulsations of waves traveling by that are driven by tides and by uh, variable winds. Um, and so we get a, a sense of what this world is like. Here is a small box. I'm going to do a series of zooming into small boxes, and we're going to get a sense of how things change as we get to smaller and smaller scales. Because of the high resolution of this model, we can actually zoom in without changing the model, but that won't be true for long. Um, and just as a point, so I live in Rhode Island, which is this small state, the smallest state in the United States. One mesoscale eddy can be covered with about one to ten Rhode Islands. So here's a Rhode Island and here's a mesoscale eddy in the Gulf, in the Gulf Stream. Okay, so zooming into that little blue box, we now see the northern end of the South China Sea. Um, and now we can see a lot of even finer scale detail. Um, and you can see tidal bands propagating up onto the shelf here. And you can see temperatures down below. So these are again fronts. They're being forced by a variety of different circumstances. There's one frontal feature over here that's kind of evolving in time, which is nice. And I have put a box around that one. We're going to zoom in again, not to that particular region, but to a similar feature running a separate model. So as we zoom in, we're pushing the resolution of the model as we're getting to smaller and smaller domains. And so this is actually another model run just on that domain size. There are a few things I want to highlight about this. This is the surface temperature zone at the top, the temperature at 200 meters depth, so below the boundary layer, and then a section along the center of this channel that has this frontal feature in it. And you can see at mid-depth, there are relatively large mesoscale eddies of order 100 kilometers in the particular configuration of this model. You can see that there's a lot more stuff going on up near the surface. There's a pulsation here, which is the diurnal cycle of mixing. There are frontal features looking under them from the side, and this is an evolving structure. These evolving structures have to do with these much smaller eddies that are forming on these density interfaces that, and the temperature interfaces that are between these large eddies. So these smaller eddies are the sub-mesoscale eddies. They live within the upper boundary layer, the upper mixed layer of the ocean. Um, and they tend to form off of fronts that are pinched in between the larger eddies, larger mesoscale. 
But we have another box here. Let's zoom in again. Mm -hmm. And now we've zoomed down to a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer scale. And in the uh, upper figure, which is looking from above, and the lower figure, which is looking from the side of the average of this. So we see we have a mixed layer again. We have some, the development of some sub-mesoscale eddies. And then um, we ha now we have a wind and wave direction indicated here, which is why everything is drifting to that direction. That's because of the Ekman transport of the mixed layer, sliding that warm filament uh, to one side. Sorry, this is a periodic domain, so it's a little confusing. As things disappear off the left, they reappear on the right. But um, this is the sum as a scale sort of in its home domain. These features are kind of a few kilometers in size. They're forming off of these temperature fronts. We have one more box, a one kilometer by one kilometer box. And now we've zoomed down to the scale of approaching human scale anyway. We have a one kilometer by one kilometer box in just the upper 40 meters. In this simulation, which is actually just a zoom in of the previous simulation, we can see colors, which here are indicating temperature again. So we have cold side, a warm side. There's a temperature of front and thermal wind balance are near to it in a very intense front now, relatively narrow, only a few hundred meters wide. And where these colors are shown is where the vertical velocity is large. So this front has a very large vertical velocity associated with it, something called the secondary circulation or the overturning circulation having to do with that front. So water is being drawn into the front from the cold side and the warm side and then pushed down at the location of the front. These other features out here are actually Langmuir cells or Langmuir turbulence because this model is being forced with both wind and waves. And so the natural uh, instability of the boundary layer is Langmuir turbulence on that smaller scale. And you can see that the frontal scale and the Langmuir scale is kind of blended up together once we get down to this kind of 100 meter scale to 10 meter scale. So in sum, the ocean is vast and diverse. There are vast scales of motion, all the way from the global down to the tens of meters. And actually, the Kolmogorov length scale um, for the ocean is only uh, roughly millimeter scale. Um, so there's even more to go beyond where we have gone on this little tour before you arrive at um, the viscously damp scales. There are lots of diversity in the phenomena from tides, eddies, mesoscale eddies, the mesoscale eddies, sub-mesoscale eddies, and Langmuir turbulence are the pieces we're going to emphasize talking about today. And the reason why we need this kind of telescoping resolution to get this is we can't afford to resolve all of the scales I just showed you at the same time. That uh, 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer simulation was extremely expensive. It was much more expensive than a climate model. A climate, the climate, that high resolution climate model was many times more expensive than a typical climate model. And so to have the whole range of scales all at once just isn't possible with present computing. So at each domain, at each resolution that goes along with that domain size, we need to parameterize everything that's smaller than that scale size. And so we have to understand each scale as we go from the top to the bottom to figure out what a parameterization might be. And by parameterization, I mean a representation of the turbulent phenomena or wave-like phenomena or just unresolved phenomena that are smaller than this grid scale of a particular model. Fronts appear at each scale, as you may have noticed, at least all the scales we talked about, and they have varying intensity and varying characters of uh, the instabilities and turbulence that grow off of them at different scales. And so you might even wonder, what are the equations that are appropriate at each scale? It's all fluid dynamics, it's all Navier-Stokes, but if we're truncating at a particular resolution, you might actually think of these parameterizations as part of the governing equation. So eddy viscosity, eddy diffusivity, or maybe a familiar example of that, but much more subtle uh, parameterizations have been developed in recent years. Okay, so what's the sub-mesoscale like? 
Well, some mesoscale is this kind of one to 10 kilometer eddies. So we can look at sea surface temperature from satellites like this upper image on the upper left and you see both mesoscale eddies and submesoscale wrinkles. Here's a simulation that's just focused on a warm side and a cold side of one front developing the submesoscale eddies, which gives you a sense of scale and tens of kilometers. And it's, these phenomena are mostly trapped within the mixed layer. And over on this side, this is a false color image of ocean colors showing um, that chlorophyll and surfactants and other things that might affect the ocean coloration are also being evicted along these fronts and drawn into these submesoscale instabilities. The interesting thing about the submesoscale is that the Rossby number is order one rather than small as it was at the larger mesoscale. And similarly, because it's in this weakly stratified boundary layer, the Richardson number is also order one. You put those two pieces together and there's very few approximations you can make to describe the submesoscale. It tends to be almost the full uh, high complexity of the hydrostatic Poussinesque uh, equations. Um, these are really small features. They won't be globally resolved in a routine way, sort of an IPCC climate way, for probably a few more decades. Um, this is an estimate which I could explain if there are questions about it. One of the interesting things about these features, so not only false color, if you go out and look at sea ice, Submesoscale eddies have these fronts wrapped around them and they're actually drawing sea ice in and concentrating it into the front. So that downward motion at the front itself is actually implies a surface lateral convergence. Um, and so phenomena, whether it's sea ice or oil or uh, you know, biology, tends to get drawn into these frontal features. On even smaller scales, on the kind of tens to 100 meter scales, we talked about Langmuir turbulence. So Langmuir turbulence is driven by both the surface waves and also the winds, but it also has that characteristic of convergence zones near the surface. This is an image, a satellite image of oil after the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, and you can see these windrows is what they're called, which is the regions where the oil is collected into those surface convergence zones of these overturning cells. Here's an airplane for scale. Um, you can see also the wave crests in the sun glance going this way. The waves are propagating in this direction and it's perpendicular to the direction of those convergence, uh, the axes of those convergence zones. These are large Rossby number, so relatively non-rotating and or in a planetary sense uh, phenomena, small Richardson number. So we're traversing not only physical space, but also parameter space as we jump through these different kinds of instabilities to think about. Now, both the submesoscales and the Langmuir scale live in that uh, weakly stratified surface layer. So this is an, uh, from Argo Floats. This is a climatology on just on repeat, showing months of the year um, and showing how deep that layer is. So the ocean itself is about four kilometers deep, but that boundary layer varies from tens of meters to a few hundreds of meters. Um, it's deeper in the wintertime hemisphere, and um, that's a, that is part, that's the home to our submesoscales and Langmuir scales. And you might say, well, why is that boundary layer there? I talked a little bit about the pulsing diurnal cycle before, but the boundary layer is there because there's constantly wind-driven and wave-driven mixing, but also convectively driven mixing. This is a nice um, illustration of how that works using the same MIT GCM model that um, I was talking about before in a different configuration than the MIT, than the LLC 4320, but a useful one. Here, the swirling patterns are indicating the wind stress on the surface of the ocean. The co pulsing colors are the air-sea heat fluxes, so cooling and heating the ocean. And then this is this magenta line, teal magenta line, is actually a temperature. So there's a front right there. That front is actually the Gulf Stream or one of the major temperature interfaces in the Gulf Stream. And then in green contours, you can actually see the mixed layer depth underneath. So in this image, you say, oh, the atmosphere is a turbulent fluid and the ocean is relatively stationary. And that's 
one of the things that we know about the way that the climate system works, because largely because the ocean has such an enormous heat capacity in comparison to the atmosphere. But if we just speed up the clock, we see that the ocean is also a turbulent fluid. So these mixed layer anomalies and temperature fronts are actually really a turbulent flow, um, superimposed in this kind of, it looks, it appears stochastic now, that air sea flux of heat and the wind stresses. And so it's this stochastic or semi-stochastic forcing that's causing that well-mixed boundary layer, but that well-mixed boundary layer is evolving within this frontal structure as a turbulent fluid on its own and making, uh, making the changes to the mixed layer as it goes. So it's nice to contrast this to the traditional approach of how you would approach a turbulent boundary layer. And Wingard's book on atmospheric boundary layers is high, I would highly recommend it. I taught with it partly this semester. And this is just a few equations nicely taken from this sort of traditional approach. You say, well, let's take a steady state momentum balance. So let's use a small, uh, uh, and we'll collect the ageostrophic terms to this term, the geostrophic terms here, and then there might be a turbulent flux divergence on the other side. Um, in two different directions. And then if you were in a barotropic convective boundary layer, you'd have that turbulence, but you wouldn't have these horizontal baroclinic terms in the temperature. And then you would see, you know, you'd be able to think about the shear that would result and you'd come up with nice shear profiles and whatever. But as we've just seen throughout the ocean and actually throughout the atmosphere as well, these temperature terms are not always zero. And in fact, they're the representation of a highly turbulent flow that's happening in the boundary layer as all of these submesoscale structures and fronts are evolving. And so throwing away those terms lead, makes the boundary layer theory simple, leads you to an ordinary differential equation from a, from a partial differential equation, but it doesn't actually help you understand those submesoscale structures that depend on the lateral gradients in temperature. And so if you look in, an acoustic sounder in the convective atmospheric boundary layer, you actually see lots of lateral gradients. Maybe the large scale variations are not so different, but there's certainly plenty of lateral gradients in the atmosphere. And similarly, if you tow a uh, uh, temperature and salinity sensor behind a boat in the ocean, there are lateral gradients in the density field and temperature field um, in this, within the mixed layer at the surface above the more stratified ocean interior. Those gradients turn out to have a nice spectral slope, which is uh, close to k to the minus two. Um, and it is not only just one big front that's making k to the minus two, that would be the power spectrum for a single jump. It's actually, if you zoom in and zoom out, you keep getting k to the minus two on a variety of scales in most locations. So the mixed layer is not totally mixed, it's just vertically mixed and fronts are common. Okay, so why do we have these fronts? So we've had, uh, I think you now have a sense that they're consistently present and ubiquitous. They can be the result of mesoscale straining, but they can also be the result of vertical mixing. They're sharpened by a process called frontogenesis, and frontogenesis is arrested by turbulence and instabilities. I'll show you what I mean. So we already talked about this simulation where we have the large mesoscale eddies straining fronts in between them, and those fronts are then going unstable to smaller sub-mesoscale eddies. But here's a nice example of a mixing-driven front. Here is Hurricane Katrina developing across, as it crosses the Gulf of Mexico. And underneath, you see that it has left a cold wake of well-mixed upper ocean fluid. So it's mixing down, the mixed layer is deep, entraining deeper water and leaving behind the cold fluid layer. And if you simulate a cold wake like that, you see that it is rife with the same kinds of submesoscale instabilities, diurnal cycle pulsations that we've been seeing in these other simulations. Um, depending on how wide this front is, how intense those sides are, different phenomena can actually end up determining um, what's the dominant mechanism in, in this case. This paper that we had put together by a bunch of my different of my students um, helped us to clarify some of the scaling laws that are relevant there. Okay, 
So now let's get a little bit into the JFM style thinking. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the dynamical side. Let's get a little bit more uh, mathematical. We have a good sense of where the fronts are, where they come from. Let's talk a little bit about sharpening by frontogenesis and also the front gen genetic arrest. And this is gonna feature a lot, a paper by Abby Bodner, who's a student in my, uh, grad student of mine. Um, and, um, but also there's been lots of other stuff, um, some former members of my group down here um, when we get to the linkage to waves. Okay, so in Abby's paper, she has an idealized frontal setup, which is very similar to the uh, Shakespeare and Taylor paper that's, um, that we, and also the early Hoskins papers on frontogenesis. The Shakespeare and Taylor papers are ones of the, some of the ones that were uh, opened up by, um, by JFM for a reading after this seminar, if you wanna go see those. And so here is a, a cross section looking through a front. Here's buoyancy surfaces that are vertical to, or near vertical like this. And here's that along front flow, and here's the opposing flow that is due to the thermal wind. So we have a shear here because it's, there's a temperature gradient. And so we have a flow um, in one direction at the top, other direction at the bottom. This is early in the front to genesis stage. Later on, we see that the buoyancy contours have been pinched into this corner and the front has become very intense um, at just these tiny locations. And the reason for this pinching is both because there's a large scale strain field, but also there's a secondary circulation having to do with the front itself. So it's overturning in the front in this kind of a sense. You can see the arrows are indicating this is the stream function of that overturning. And what it does is it brings these temperature levels together and pinches them off in that corner and this corner in a feature like this. So the lay term has this much more intense overturning circulation. So frontogenesis is the, essentially the effect of this overturning circulation and enhancing the strength of the front even beyond what the external straining by the eddy field would, would provide. Um, and this tends to happen whenever you have a geostrophic front of sufficient strength that it, would, that, and that it will have this secondary circulation the secondary circulation could be frontogenetic as it is in this setup, or it could be frontolytic and go the other way. That's part of the game. So what Abby developed was a mathematical theory to consider how turbulence, small scale stuff, might affect this frontogenetic process. And um, because it was a mathematical theory, an analytic one, it was better to represent the turbulence through simple parameterizations like eddy viscosity and diffusivity. And what this shows is that if we use horizontal viscosity or vertical viscosity or vertical diffusivity or horizontal diffusivity, we get radically different answers in terms of the frontal tendency, which is the tendency for that temperature gradient to sharpen over time. Um, and you can see, and so this is a dimensionless measure of how much viscosity there is, and this is a dimensionless measure of how much diffusivity there is. And the point here is that for a particular value shown in red in each one of these, you can delay, keep the frontal tendency right near zero for a long time. So if you had just the right amount of turbulence, this red line, you would be able to arrest the intensification of that front um, with some of these phenomena, whether they're the horizontal or vertical diffusivities, you have to go into detail and think about each of these cases in turn. The vertical diffusivity is kind of an interesting one. It doesn't seem like it arrests very effectively under any of them. It will pretty much always tracks together. So um, this is part of the understanding um, there have also been some important direct numerical simulations or large eddy simulations of this frontal arrest process. This recent one also in JFM um, is well worth reading and it's another one of the papers that um, has been opened up. Okay, so we have a sense of, of how fronts are formed. We have a sense of how we might understand that they will interact with turbulence and in particular they will um, that turbulence might arrest them. What about waves? That was another one of our things that we were thinking about. 
So we often think about waves as being uh, breaking waves that we see at the beach. But when you're out in the open ocean, um, breaking waves are, uh, there are lots of waves and they're not always breaking. And so Langmuir turbulence or Langmuir cells are the response to waves that don't break in the upper ocean. Um, there are other responses to waves that don't break, which I'm not going to go into today, but um, the way that we handle and express Langmuir turbulence is through um, the uh, combined effect of winds and waves normally is modeled using the wave averaged equation. So we average over the orbital velocities of the waves and we retain only the small uh, secondary pieces of the wave of the wave uh, Lagrangian transports. That is the Stokes drift of the waves is the only part that makes its way into the wave average equations. Um, waves can do a lot of other interesting things in the climate system, which we don't have time to talk about today, but um, here's a paper you can go look at and um, I may have a chance to talk about a few of the other things at the end. So this instead of this simulation that we were talking about in the 20 by 20 kilometer domain, has both Langmuir's turbulence and also fronts. And the Langmuir turbulence and the fronts is interestingly interacting. And so if we zoomed into different one by one kilometer boxes, we see an interesting diversity of different responses. The fronts are absent in some places, very strong in others. Um, and there's a cold side, a warm side. How does that all work together? And this is also seen in nature. This isn't just a simula this isn't just a simulation artifact. Here's a nice front that you can see in this uh, sediment plume. In this is in Rhode Island, um, and you can see some Langmuir windrows coming up and then inflecting to a different direction on the other side of the front, um, which is a really pretty example of the kind of phenomena um, that we're talking about. Okay. But one quick thing we have to touch on here is what pays the bills, parameterizing turbulence. This is how we, this is where we're going with all this beautiful dynamics is we'd like to improve climate and weather models through keeping these pieces in, in the game. Um, and so all these turbulent phenomena aren't only pretty, they accumulate into effects that might have global impact, especially the boundary layer depth. So the boundary layer in turn filters the exchange of energy and carbon between the atmosphere and the ocean, the deep ocean reservoir. Um, and so Langmuir turbulence is an excellent recent example. It energizes the boundary layer turbulence beyond what you'd get if you just had winds. And so it makes entrainment and mixing faster. I don't wanna dwell on this. This isn't really the primary topic of what we're talking about, but I wanna frame these pieces, last few pieces in terms of that. Um, so, in a series of papers, we've been developing Langmuir mixing schemes. And really the only point that we have to know here is that if you have a climate model without a representation of Langmuir, it has a different boundary layer depth than one that does. And you can then go and ask whether the boundary layer depth in this version of the model that includes the Langmuir mixing is better than that one. And this table of lots of numbers is RMS errors. And basically it's showing that the more sophisticated you get with your Langmuir mixing, the better you can do at representing this boundary layer depth. So it's a missing process in typical climate models. Um, and sometimes you can go wrong and actually make things worse, which we did with our first guess of how to do entrainment. And we're gonna be stuck with these kind of issues for a long time to come. We, you might say, well, let's just resolve everything. We've got really big supercomputers. But the problem is, is refining resolution and our computers are getting exponentially faster, like Moore's Law, which is shown here on this figure in the blue line. This is showing ocean model resolution as a function of the year of IPCC assessment reports going this way. Um, and this is black line is the median and the red line is the kind of bleeding edge. And so making resolution finer is actually exponentially hard. <laughs> So even though Moore's law is giving us exponentially faster computers, we're actually only increasing um, with this kind of a rate. Now, if we want to resolve mesoscale eddies, that's actually pretty close on the horizon, but sub-mesoscale and boundary layer scales remain far in the future. 
late this century, early next century. So we're stuck with parameterizations um, for quite a while on these kind of phenomena. Okay, we could also parameterize the other instabilities, and I realized my time is short, like submesoscale eddies, we've developed a parameterization of that. And if you look at the boundary layer depth in a high resolution model and turn on a parameterization of submesoscale eddies, what it does is it shoals the mixed layer as those little boundary, those fronts are able to be turned over by the mixed layer eddies. And when they turn over, they're then harder to mix through. Um, symmetric instability is an even more small scale phenomenon than a submesoscale instability. It's somewhere in between the Langmuir scale and the submesoscale. And this is just a beautiful visualization from Sean Haney showing the development of those symmetric instabilities here within this part of the boundary layer where the, the arrangement of currents is such that the potential vorticity is negative, but Langmuir turbulence sitting right next to it where the potential vorticity is positive. And so you can see qualitatively that the symmetric instabilities and the Langmuir turbulence are different. They go to different depths, they have different properties. And so one of the great thing, pleasures of what my visit to Cambridge was working together with John Taylor and Scott Bachman on developing, and also Leif Thomas, who was remote, on developing a parameterization of the symmetric instability effects while we were there. There we go. Um, these eddies are small. I'll skip that part. Okay, so we've got a position. We've got these instabilities. They will affect the climate system if we parameterize them. We've got waves, we've got fronts. Is there one more link of dynamical link that we need to think about? And this is the last topic of the, of the papers and JFM that uh, have been opened up, which was this paper uh, with Jim McWilliams and myself and back in 2013, but there's a more recent one there are quite a few more recent ones on this topic that are also opened up. So near the surface, waves matter a lot for the rate of mixing and the turbulent structures. Fronts are also important. They affect the lateral processes. They stimulate these instabilities and they affect transport. But the presence of wave forcing at the surface actually energizes the fronts. So frontogenesis can be a faster with waves. Let me give you a quick tour of what I mean by that. So Stokes drift, as we said, is the key way. This is the average, the slow drift over the orbital motion of the waves. And it comes into the equations of motion as an advection, as a perturbed Coriolis parameter, and also through a downward force called the Stokes shear force. And so you might think that, oh, we can just revisit thermal wind balance, including the Stokes advection. And you do, and that is actually closer when you have the Stokes, the Stokes uh, forces include, included to what you uh, find in the frontal balances in this high resolution simulations. But let me explain a little bit how this Stokes shear force works. It's a funny kind of term. It's like a Reynolds stress um, and it's a second order uh, correlation. It's depends on the Lagrangian current and its dot product into the Stokes force or the gradients of the Stokes force. So it's a funny kind of tensor object. Um, but this diagram illustrates it nicely that it is, um, if you have the Stokes drift in the same direction as the Lagrangian flow velocity indicated here with blue arrows, you get a downward force from this term. And if it's in the opposite direction, you get an upward force. And so depending on the direction of the waves versus the direction of your current, you might actually get a, a variety of different vertical effects. And so rather than a hydrostatic balance, if this scale parameter, which goes like the Stokes drift and Coriolis and other aspects of the wave field is large enough, you might get a wavy hydrostatic balance where the waves are contributing in the same way that the buoyancy contributes in the vertical momentum equation. And so now when we go back and see this large vertical velocity right along the front, and we see these large vertical velocities along the Langmuir cells, we appreciate that 
those are all in the direction of the winds and waves. That's actually that downward Stokes shear force that's pushing down at the center of those. But the interesting thing is, is it seems to be quite similar for the front and the Langmuir turbine. So maybe fronts behave like Langmuir cells in this particular regard. And so, thinking that through a little, do we get a downward force in the middle of a front the same way as we do in a Langmuir cells? Well, we expect to see a downward force for downflow Stokes drift in that wavy hydrostatic limit. Not even the Langmuir cells are strongly non hydrostatic, but the fronts might be hydrostatic, but they probably are wavy hydrostatic. And so, if we go back to this simulation that involves all of the fronts and all the Langmuir cells together, side by side, can we analyze some of these fronts and make sense of that? And one thing that we notice is that if the front is not aligned with the wind and waves in the particular direction we're looking, we don't get a very strong front. And you might say, well, how big is this Stokes force correction factor? Well, it's hard to estimate it on its own because it has some parameters that are difficult to estimate, but it's pretty easy to compare it to the Rossby number. And the Rossby number, remember, is how agiostrophic our fronts are likely to be. So this is sort of how, non, how wavy non-hydrostatic are our fronts likely to be versus how agiostrophic are they likely to be. And you can see in some regions of the world, this is estimated from uh, wave models and data, um, uh, observational data, um, this number can be quite big so that the wavy non-hydrostatic effect might actually be larger than the agiostrophic finite Rossby effect that we would normally think about when we think about frontal dynamics. Okay, so the last piece of this story, let's talk about one front in particular. Here's a nice one. It's um, it, within that simulation, and this is showing the horizontal velocity. So there's the surface part of that front. It's right in the same direction as the wind and waves. So we expect a strong Stokes shear force. Here's the temperature gradient associated with it. Again, really, really sharp, right and aligned with the wind and waves. Here's the vertical velocity associated with it. Again, really concentrated right on top of that wind and waves. And this little box we're going to look at from the side in just a second. And here's what happens if you release drifters into this flow field. They all pile up either in Langmuir cells out here in the free, free flowing, but right along that front in there. If we look from the side, here's the temperature. There's the surface temperature gradient that we just saw. Here's the structure. And here's that overturning stream function that drives frontogenesis. And notice that kink right there. That kink is actually the sign of the Stokes shear force kicking the overturning stream function downward as you go along. And so if we diagnose how much of the vorticity associated with that overturning is contributed by different causes, the Stokes shear force causes about half as much as the normal forces that we think of in front genesis. So this is not a trivial effect. This is a leading order impact of the connection between waves and Stokes forces. All right, I'm gonna skip over that little piece and close just on the idea that if we're thinking about things like cascades of energy through these scales or accumulation of debris or drifters and the statistics like a structure function or something that comes out of these kind of features. We need to be really careful that Lagrangian instruments and Lagrangian flows will tend to concentrate into these strong fronts and that will both skew the statistics but also bring together the sea ice, bring together the oil, bring together drifters. This is a beautiful movie from the laser drifter release in the Gulf of Mexico. Watch all the pink ones. They go zip all into one point, <laughs> which is an amazing thing. It's anti-diffusive. It's going into a point from a distribution of drifters. And also, the way that these fronts represent the underlying statistics of dissipation and fronts throughout the world and what that looks like. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if I have any time left. Um, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this and it's taken a little uh, 
out of the Friday afternoon or Friday morning or Friday evening, depending on what time zone you're in, um, and giving you something to think about. Thank you. So I, I think in that sense, what I mean is that the important questions about climate have things to do with impacts on humans and su sustainability and those pieces among the dynamics this is actually an interesting aspect of the dynamics, but even there, you might say that things like clouds and the meridional overturning circulation are uh, a more fundamental piece. This is a, a, a fascinating correction to those stories. Um, a, we know that it affects the boundary layer depth quite significantly, um, order of 10 to 40 percent, um, depending on location and time of year. But we don't fully understand how changes to the boundary layer depth then affect climate downstream. I think that part of it needs to be further quantified. So aside from an amusing you know, restatement about football being the most uh, of important of the unimportant things, which I thought was a, a good place to start, mm -hmm. I think that uh, the, the essence of what I want to say here is that this is a correction factor, but this, but you know, it's a pretty substantial one, but among the things that are smaller than the leading order things. This is not, this is not quite like a Reynolds stress. This is a, just a, a correlation. So let me go back. This is not a three wave effect exactly. This is a coupling between the slow modes, which here are the turbulent modes and the wave modes. Um, and it is a, a residual of the wave averaging procedure. So this uh, term that appears here that I'm calling, putting in the wavy hydrostatic only appears in equation sets that are like the Craig Leibovitch equations. And so they have an, they, this is averaging over the uh, wave period. So um, it's not a vorticity free fluid. It is not a purely irrotational wave. It is a, the assumption here like Craig Leibovich style is that things are irritational on small scales and rotational on large scales. So the vorticity in the fluid is being uh, affected by the Stokes drift of the, of the waves. One of the interesting things about sea ice um, is its interaction with waves. So in the marginal ice zone where the sea ice is not pack ice yet, but it's just a little bit of ice, this is actually off the coast of New England um, in wintertime. The waves and the sea ice are interacting in a way so that the formation of flows or the fracture of flows has a lot to do with the propagation of waves through the flows. Um, and that's one piece of the story. And then another piece is whether the, you know, we often think about what, how the changes to the Arctic would occur if it were ice free. One of the changes is that it suddenly becomes wavy. Uh, thick enough pack ice would, would block all of the waves. Only the longest waves propagate through sea ice very far, and they don't make it into the center of the Arctic on, uh, at the moment. So this, the arrival of this boundary layer turbulence, much more invigorated boundary layer turbulence driven by both exposure to winds, exposure to convection, and exposure to waves is one of the changes that we would like to understand for the understanding the future of the Arctic. The topography, yes, if there are topographic features underneath, they might actually structure the flow above. There are quite a few permanent frontal structures in places like uh, a river plume is maybe the most obvious one, but lots of other fronts around the world are held down by topographic features and kept from migrating around. Um, all of the simulations I've talked about here are flat bottom or, you know, uh, a slip, slippery bottom. Um, Andy Hogg's group uh, uh, in Australia has done some very nice work on thinking about these kinds of frontal instabilities and fronts as they orient themselves around bottom topography. Oh, yeah. So those are interesting. Uh, oh, I can try and get back to that. Well, every, I hope everyone remembers that was the, uh, the, the weather meets the ocean movie. So this one. Um, 
the streaming motions, so this is using a visualization of the little particles that are in the atmosphere. Uh, and so I believe that these wind stresses are actually coming out of topographic features on land, and these are kind of catabatic winds and things that are being represented um, in the, the concentration of streamers off particular locations. I'm not totally sure that it's not a visual bias due to the particle transport though. Uh, it, it's, it may be quite blurry on your end. Um, it's a little hard to tell. So I would be hesitant to assign necessarily physical rather than visualization um, biases to that. But I, there are certainly interesting windlets and jets that are coming off of land in the real world. And I think that's what uh, it would be if it was a physical explanation. Yes, um, that's a great question. For uh, these features are small and fast moving, which makes them quite difficult to observe. Um, but in a few circumstances, um, you can find out um, whether the scaling laws, these parameterizations that we're proposing at least are correct or heading in the right direction. This is one example um, from Eric DeSaro and company. Um, this is their Lagrangian drifter. This is a relatively small one meter scale instrument and it goes up and down riding along on Langmuir cells or whatever boundary layer turbulence you have. Um, and so the vertical velocity of this instrument is, can be associated with the vertical velocity of the, those overturning motions and uh, Langmuir cells. And um, without a whole lot of mess about what these different parameters are, these green lines are the observations. This dashed line is what would happen if there were no Langmuir turbulence. And this black line is one estimate of the right scaling law for Langmuir turbulence. So as you get to the very wavy end of things, or the purely windy with low waves case end of things, um, it seems that there is actually an enhancement in the amount of boundary layer mixing you get, at least for Langmuir turbulence. Submesoscales, there's many, many experiments, including some of the people who've been listening in on this call all over the world. I think we, we are still looking for more examples of submesoscale frontal instabilities and um, trying to make sure that all of the simulations are really doing what the real world is. 